Since the room is full, I think we'll get started a couple of minutes early. Uh, so my name is Andy Day. I'm the Senior Director for Healthcare and Life Sciences at Tableau, responsible for industry strategy and marketing for providers, payers, pharma, and med devices. Uh, so we conceived and created the Healthcare and Life Sciences track four years ago to provide a forum and a platform for our customers to share their best practices with other customers in response to obviously a huge unfulfilled need. And, and, and this is personally gratifying for me that uh, from a little room that held about 50 people four years ago, we are, we are now you know, at, a, you know, at a place where we have, we have a standing room only audience in a, in a room this size. So uh, uh, again, so this is not only the largest uh, TC we have had with 17,000 plus customers, it's also our largest uh, healthcare audience ever, which is, which is awesome. So uh, as part of the healthcare track, as well as the Tableau for Healthcare webinar series, which I sponsor and run, we've been very fortunate, right? We have had the likes of the Cleveland Clinic, Intermountain Healthcare, Mayo Clinic, I mean, name any healthcare system, and they've come and shared best practices literally across the enterprise, going from strategic planning, HR, clinical population health management, uh, finance revenue cycle management, operations supply chain management. So we've covered a lot of areas in the clinical area. A lot of, uh, we actually have a webinar series on population health management, extremely informative. If you are interested, please go onto the you know, Tableau Healthcare page and you'll see a link there. A gap we have had, which, which we have not addressed, we have not had the opportunity to address thus far was the clinical care you know, design area, clinical care protocol design. So we are fortunate, we are gonna make up for that by having two presentations this year. The first of which is gonna be presented by Walter and, and Donna, who are both clinical BI analysts at the Lehigh Valley Health System uh, in an epic environment. And then tomorrow, Paul Lampy from Memorial Hermann is going to present, again, a similar story on clinical care redesign from an operations and performance management perspective uh, in a Cerner environment. So you're gonna get two very different perspectives on what is clearly a very critical uh, and outcome driving arena within clinical. So with that brief introduction, Walter and Donna, all yours. Please take it away. Thank you. So, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Quick show of hands. Everybody hear us okay? Yeah. And how many in here run Epic? Quite a few. So yeah, it is a really popular uh, EMR these days. And we've been running Epic for probably two and a half to three years now, give or take. Um, I guess it's probably closer to three years. Yeah. And we've been using Tableau probably for two, closing on two and a half years now. So what we're gonna focus on today, looking at our agenda, is the clinical care pathways and how we've used Tableau to enhance our clinical care in the network. So we'll just give you a little bit about the, our network, where we started, challenges we faced, our data platform as it is now, uh, then we'll jump into some use cases, some different metrics that are specific to the clinical care pathways, and then leave you with how we distribute our Tableau workbooks, and then how we handle our protected health information as well. So a little bit about us. Just a long list of where we are, who we are, just the different locations. These, this visualization you actually see on screen here is relative to a clinical care pathway. This one actually is our knee replacements and where they are coming from. So we, we really span across all of eastern, northeastern, north central Pennsylvania. Uh, we're just above Philly, probably, I don't know, a million people in our metro area, but we also span out up toward the Poconos, toward the northern tier of, of Pennsylvania, and have recently acquired some hospital campuses out there as well. So just some of the awards our IT department has won recently, the stage seven uh, designation for inpatient and ambulatory. Uh, I know offhand the inpatient designation for stage seven is only for 5% of the hospitals in the US. So that's one we're very proud of. Uh, most wired awards, we have quite a few of them along the way, the Davies Award, um, and this has all happened you know, in the past two years, give or take. So in the beginning, what we started with with Epic reporting, just your standard Epic tools, your Crystal reports, your Webby, your BOE environment, uh, Slicer Dicer, 
built into hyperspace, locked into hyperspace. Uh, what you see on the screen here, one point about this report, this is a hyper, hyperspace crystal report, uh, one I had developed specific for our orthopedic order set compliance. This one actually relates back to that map you just saw for the knee replacements, because this is the data set that we used to define that visualization. Um, with some of the crystal reports, you know, slow to, slow to develop and slow to deploy really had the old school waterfall development method. Um, moving over to Tableau, it's more of the iterative, ongoing enhancements to them. So even the SAP, Webby, Lumera environments, more self-service, but still slower, had to be defined data sets created by IT, uh, the IT department. Just kind of basic stuff, nothing that's giving you the advanced visualizations that Tableau can provide. So leading into that of just what Walter said, we have many challenges that we face every day, every week, um, and you know, number one on that list is data. Um, if any of you know Epic, it's really hard to get sometimes the data out of the system um, and finding um, the correct data elements when you're given a report request. Um, and sometimes it's even bridging a gap between the clinical and the technical side because we're talking two different languages sometimes and just trying to get the data out. But uh, developing it in Tableau, there's more of an open discussion. And now, uh, based on just some of the pathways we've implemented, it's they're, they're getting a lot more savvier and being able to say what they want and how they want it. So um, we spend a lot of time validating also that we want the data that we are pulling is correct. Um, PHI, big, big, um, serious um, deal that we, we deal with every day, protecting the personal health information and making sure that um, the data is restricted to the proper users. And we get a lot of requests before even Tableau was implemented for, we just want downloads of Excel. And you're like, we discourage that. And we're just, based on just uh, deploying Tableau, we are getting to the point where we don't have those requests as often because they're actually able to get to their data. They see the aggregate and they get down to the details and that's what they want all along. Um, as Walter said, time-consuming report development in Epic. Sometimes if I have to go back and write in a crystal report, I want to cry, honestly, um, because I'm so in the Tableau world that, and it, it's just to, to try to, to stay within, you know, what Epic wants us, you know, how to develop a report and give someone a 500-page report that they're going to find not useful at all is, is just hard sometimes for me to stomach honestly, um, the large backlog log of requests to um, modify or create um, existing Epic reports takes time where we're standing up dashboards in you know, s less time and Days. people are finding them so much more useful um, and difficult to identify trends and outliers with those Epic hyperspace reports that um, there's just so much stuff going on within the hospital for lower cost of care, but also the quality of care and trying to manage that. And Tableau has given us that opportunity versus trying to get these reports out in hyperspace. Um, finding reports to meet the business needs. Again, in the Epic world, just trying to track down, it covers many modules across everything and you're trying to find if there's an existing report it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack sometimes and when then when you don't find that report because it doesn't meet the exact specific needs of what someone's trying to to do with the data you're left to recreate it and again write another crystal report that you don't know whether it's going to be used or not um, limited uh, self-service. Again, Slicer, Dicer, and Webby just aren't cutting it. And as we roll these dashboards out, again, they're getting more savvier. They're like, put me on the Tableau train. <laughs> like, I'm ready. I want that dashboard. I want to see my data that way. Don't give me a 500-page hyperspace report. Then I'm not going to be able to see my outliers and see the trending. Um, so kind of that's, that's where we're at and we're still challenging it. Uh, Walter and I sometimes say we just, we're trying to get more people to drink the Kool-Aid 
as far as you know, getting away from from one type of paradigm to another. Um, and you know, the tide has turned in that regard too. When we started down this path, a lot of people weren't trusting the data. They would look at it and they would see a visualization and say, you know, that just doesn't feel right. We don't hear that anymore either. People have come to a point now, two years on, they believe what they see. If, if there's an outlier, if there's something that just doesn't look right, they're more prone to go in and investigate the data, look and see who the patients are, who might be the outlier in this case. You know, that's, that's, that's a huge fundamental shift in how our organization looks at the data. Yeah, they're more trusting because now they can see the aggregated data and they know their data. They can see something's off and they can either pinpoint it to it's something within their clinical workflow or it's maybe something that we're not pulling right, but there's actually, it's, it's better turnaround yeah. in actually troubleshooting. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, and you made a good point. There is this disconnect. You know, our titles say clinical business analyst. So we, ha we understand the clinical system, we understand Epic, but we're not actually clinical people. My background for 10 plus years was actually as a software developer. So I worked with a lot of data, a lot of ETL processes before coming to Lehigh Valley, but now it's just more so focused on data and aggregating, collating, you know, that first data point. So many data points finding the right one. Uh, that's probably three quarters of the challenge. Basically coming together with your clinicians, with your providers, and making sure you have the right patient populations finding the right thing. So I feel like we're maybe getting a little ahead of ourselves well, yeah, on some of that. Well, yeah, we're just that, like but, leading, you know. leading into. So like, why Tableau? So why did we go down this path to begin with? You know, faster development, faster insights. You know, it would have taken weeks to develop, you know, some static report that's just going to go in a, an Excel file. Well, you know, we can throw together a proof of concept in a day and have an insight. And, you know, maybe we see something that looks a little off. Well, now we can maybe pull in more data and we don't have to wait two weeks and go through change cycles again and again. Really minimal end user training too. It, everyone has found Tableau and the workbooks we publish to be intuitive. You know, they, they discover quickly that you can click on something to filter and it shows you, you know, related data, shows you trends. So one of the, you know, this one that we have here, this is the knee replacement. Um, so I know at one point our length of stay spiked for a month. Well, it just happened that there was an emergency case. So, you know, someone who actually ended up with two knee replacements had a really long length of stay. Well, it's really easily identi and identifiable. You're never gonna identify that looking at some 50 page document. So, and you know, back to, you know, one of the earlier points, the transparency and the culture change. We are becoming a data-driven organization. People wanna see the data and you know, you can't just make decisions based on, based on a gut feeling anymore. You need to know which practices are under budget, which are over budget. You know, if they're, if they're way over budget, well, maybe they need more staff to help with that backlog. I have to add something to that though, but in just what you said, it was another thing it does is sometimes you have something going on in the organization and they're thinking that something is going on and they're, right. they're, they are certain it's going on. Mm -hmm. And we have developed, or more so Walter has <laughs> developed more of those where they, they, they want him to throw up a dashboard and it disproves what they thought. Mm -hmm. And it's actually something else and it, that's quite... We, like, we couldn't do that before. We couldn't. There, there was no way with the existing reporting that you know we had to use via Epic to, to ever do that. And just sometimes it's a great way to you know, management and before it turns into this huge, like um, scary, like, oh my gosh, something's going on and mm -hmm. I think it's this. And it, it actually has disproved and calmed people down and they're looking at the correct things. Yep. So just had to add that. Yeah. So our data platform. This is really a simplified view related almost specifically, specifically to our clinical care pathways and our clinical work. So the Epic Chronicles, that's our operational database. Epic Clarity, our reporting database. We also have some other data sources that aggregate a variety of things, call center metrics, IT cases, requests, whatever it might be. We feed this 
to our Tableau desktop developers. They create the workbooks, create the data sources. A lot of that is done within our team, our analytics team. We publish all of that up to our server and then disseminate it out to our Tableau server users. The users can be clinical, can be executive level, management level. Um, in, in some cases for the IT workbooks, they're just open to everybody. You know, your call center resolution time. Well, that's a stat that everyone network-wide should know. So our clinical care pathways. What we're gonna do here is just talk a little bit about our journey, the different metrics, the different pieces that make up our clinical care pathways. And this is where we started. Dumb boldness is the best way to approach a new challenge. <laughs> that really sums up how we approach this. So go back uh, roughly November 2017, December 2017. We recently had a new CIO come in. Both of us were probably not with the team more than six months at that point. Right. Um, and we were just basically handed it Tableau and said, here, see what you can make of this, see if it's worthwhile. We didn't know where it was going. We just had ideas, put them together, and you know, kind of threw stuff at the wall to see what would stick. So what is a clinical care pathway? Simply, it's just a standard of care for your common procedures and illnesses. You're getting a knee replacement done. You know, you know your doctor, your nurse should be ambulating you a couple hours after the surgery. You should be getting this painkiller instead of that painkiller and it should be this specific dose. It's those sort of things. And we knew, you know, the providers, the clinicians, everyone knows what they're supposed to do. We weren't measuring it to make sure we were doing it. So, you know, those are the questions and the insights we were looking for with this. So then, you know, in the end, how do we measure that success and what are the key metrics? They're specific to different pathways, but what we're gonna show you here, a few of the overarching common ones that you see across most, if not all, of the pathways. This is a big one for us, length of stay. So a uh, reasonable length of stay, it's gonna vary for each pathway and those clinicians know, you know, versus a uh, cardiac patient versus, uh, you know, hip replacement of what a typical length of stay is and they monitor this because it's the length of stay reduction uh, equ equates to lower costs and hopefully uh, better quality of care. Um, reducing length of stay not only um, will reduce the costs, but it can, we can accept maybe a new readmission for some, a new admission for someone else who needs care that, um, yeah. you know, the hospitals get full and, and you know, they're, they're, the ED's full and they're just trying to reduce length of stay and get someone in a room who actually needs it. And when it comes to things like knee replacements, like hip replacements, your common procedures anymore, there's a big factor in insurance too. They only wanna pay for so many days. If it's longer, well, you're gonna be losing money there too. And from the patient side, you know, none of us want to spend any more time than we need to in the hospital. We wanna get home, we wanna be comfortable. Right, so in this particular case, we use the ileostomy length of stay because you can see it reduced from what was 26.4 days to 10.9 days for length of stay and also the post-op length of stay from 20.5 to 8.7 days. And this is typically how we visualize a lot of the length of stay. It's the overall length of stay. Then depending on what we're looking at, you know, ileostomy versus, you know, some sort of heart procedure, you might want to look at the post-op length of stay. stay. Um, for COPD, for instance, I know we look at the emergency length of stay. How long did it take them to get from you know, the emergency department to an actual inpatient bed? So some, some of the metrics, overall length of stay, pretty common across everything. But then we have more specific metrics like that post-op length of stay, like an emergency length of stay. Those are common across the different pathways. So CMI, your case mix index. This one's becoming more and more popular because it was related to how the procedure gets coded. So the target CMI generally, uh, uh, um, generally across the board is a one. So as you can see here, you know, somewhere along the way, we were dipping below that one marker. Well, how much, you know, you're, you're down by a tenth of a point. How much does that really matter? 
Well, that could be potentially $800,000. So you know, that's a big in impact on the bottom line. You want to make sure you're standardized and coding your procedures in the right way. Readmissions. Nobody <laughs> wants to come back <laughs> if they don't have to. So this is monitored um, very closely um, because normally on our dashboard, you won't only just see this particular type of visual, but we combine it with demographics, we combine it with what was, you know, how, how soon did they come back to the hospital? And they really focus on the one to seven days, but they still like to look at anything that occurred, a readmission occurring one through 30. Um, and then they will most typically look at the rate of admission over time and actually look at if the readmission rate looks really high, they will start looking for outliers and try to figure out and start pulling patient charts to figure out why, yeah. it, why it happened. Um, because again, it's not only a reflection on did the patient receive the proper care, but also um, it, we, we lose money sometimes, especially if they were readmitted with the same diagnosis that they were supposedly, yeah. you know. Re insurance yeah. generally is not going to reimburse anyone for a readmission related to the original diagnosis. Um, the goal for readmissions is always 0%. We don't want any readmissions related to the same issue. And you will find this on, as a, like a standard on every one of our inpatient dashboards. Yeah. So order sets. The order sets, you know, back to the standard of care. It's a grouping of your procedures, your, your medications, um, the things that should definitely be happening when you are receiving care for a certain illness, for a certain procedure. Generally, when, when the order sets are built within Epic, you, they, they are predefined to have certain things checked. Back to the you know, knee replacement, hip replacement, you need to ambulate at a certain time. Maybe you need some pain medication. So by looking at this then, our order set percentages, we know that the doctors, the clinicians, the providers are using the order sets. They're, so, they're looking at the right place for the right things. Uh, one of my favorite stories from early on was with the hip replacement and the knee replacement. Certain PA always just going to the hip replacement. If it was a hip replacement, if it was a knee replacement, didn't matter. That's just what they were comfortable with. So, you know, that didn't really affect the metrics overall, but it was something we noticed and could say, okay, well, we need to go educate this PA or maybe the group as a whole to understand the importance. Maybe, you know, one, at, one order set has something that the other does not that is better to use. You know, what you're doing isn't wrong, there's just a better way to do it. So, yeah, this one goes a little bit the other way. Sometimes the improvement is elusive. So we started pretty well with the hip fracture. You, you worked on this one. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, maybe you can say a little more about it, too. No, but just, I guess what we wanted to prove is that you sometimes, even putting the dashboard, we, we think that overall it, it makes a difference, and they're looking at it, and they're making improvements, and then you look at something like this and go, something's wrong. <laughs> and, you know. And I believe talking to the doctor heading up the pathway initiative, you know, they realize this order set as a whole needs to be reworked then. <clears throat> Excuse me, it doesn't have what the doctors need. So, you know, but, but it's yeah, an but actionable insight that comes from seeing Sometimes it's actionable this. and it's, it's a quicker fix and other times it's just gonna take longer um, to fix. But hopefully, you know, we'll see it start trending up when they make the changes to the order set and, and the, the, the protocol. And if we don't, then you know you just have to re refactor again. Right. So that this is kind. Those are all kind of the pieces that make up our different pathways. This here regarding pregnancy episodes. This is more of a, a focused case study on what we tracked and something we noticed along the way. So generally, we're pretty good when it comes to pregnancy episodes. We and we knew what to do but we didn't know where we could improve. So we chose a few different key metrics to track, and then we developed a Tableau workbook to monitor along the way. This was one of our original pathways, uh, original workbooks, and actually probably the original success story we had that 
we realized, yeah, I think we're really onto something here. So there were just a few key tests and vaccines measured at specific points of a pregnancy. Rubella, Tdap, uh, GBS testing, um, group B strep that would be, and the flu vaccine, which is just seasonal. So in the beginning, we just took benchmarks to see where are we starting. That's what you see by the orange line for rubella, Tdap, and GBS. Where we are right now, I think this was as of August or September, give or take, um, is indicated by the blue bar. So, you know, rubella and GBS, we were doing pretty well to start with. Tdap, 50%, yeah, there's room for improvement. But even so, we've improved along the way anyhow. So this is our overtime measurement of those four particular metrics. Uh, you know, not long after we started, roughly six months or so, actually this is measured by week, so it may, might be like two or three months. Um, you know, everything was trending upward. Come December 2017, we noticed in particular that was the rubella were trending downward. So, you know, after a week or two, yeah, it's, it's definitely a trend. We go back, we look at why, what might be happening. Well, there's actually a few things that happened. We brought on new offices, new practices. They weren't yet using the standard clinical care pathway. Okay, so if we remove them, what does it do? Well, maybe the, the numbers got a little bit better, but also there's a new prenatal package added to Epix. So that's related to an order set, different orders, different you know, procedures that are required for the pathway. Well, that one was added to Epic and the Epic build. We weren't yet tracking it on our side. Once we added those, added the uh, prenatal package in, we moved the offices not yet adhering to the pathway. The numbers rebounded immediately. So, was, you know, there was nothing really wrong on the clinical side there. It was just an update that needed to happen to our workbook to make sure we're measuring the right things. You know, that goes back to one of those lead challenges, lead in challenges. It's the data. There's so many places and so many data points. You have to find the right ones. So beyond that, also within the clinical care pathway or the uh, pregnancy episode pathway, we have KPIs for each individual patient. So you know a patient is coming in. You can look up their chart in Tableau, in the Tableau workbook, and see did they have a flu vaccine, GBS testing, see what was done, see what's on, tr on track for them. A flu vaccine is a tough one too. You know, a lot of people do get it outside of the office, whether it's CVS, a pharmacy, whatever it might be. But this gives you a, a little bit of a higher level of detail, for lack of a better term. You know, uh, you might want to focus on a high risk patient to make sure they're on track and getting what they need done. So just a summary of where we started and where we are as of August. Rubella testing, uh, yeah, up 12% since then. Tdap made a really nice jump, 47% to the 78. GBS 70 to 83. The flu vaccine is really surprising to me, even just looking at August. You know, we improved how we documented on the Epic side. We look for it in more places within the workbook. Well, it's at 36% in August. I'm really curious to see what that's going to be come December. I'm hoping that's 50 to 75%. And if we can get that kind of hit rate when we start it at 2%, I'll be really happy with that one. No offense, but I'm gonna, talk, I'm gonna call your dashboard the sunshine and lollipops <laughs> dashboard because um, what you're looking at now, it was my baby, the acute coronary syndrome which I had a lot of, had a lot of painful reiterations because originally it started with they just wanted to deal with AMI patients, which were heart attack patients. And then it developed into something much more complex and much more, let's monitor everything from low risk to high risk. We want to use diagnosis codes and you're going to put those diagnosis codes into categories and I want this dashboard, I want to be able to click on the category and I want to be able to monitor similar metrics and sometimes not so similar metrics for all of this, um, you know, 
like I said, population of low from chest pain all the way to you know, non-STEMI and STEMI patients. So, so this one was uh, quite a challenge. And why I'm showing you this screen is pretty much, this is what we call like an overview screen, which is pretty much what our clinical pathways start out with. So when they land on this overview page, it's just their higher level metrics at a glance so that hopefully um, they can see where they're at right away and they start clicking and filtering the dashboard down to what they want to see and then go into the patient details to see the outliers and more of the trending. And generally speaking, the providers, the clinicians, they don't design it, but we try to tailor the overview screen to them. What are your most important metrics? What do you care about the most? That's what we display first. Okay, so from that, this was just some of the, the goals that were, that what they're trying to measure. So, um, of course, you know, patient safety and decreasing the complications, um, increasing the clinical standardization, are the providers following the proper protocol, uh, reducing length of stay, which we've already talked about, the readmissions, already, you know, something always on, like, high priority and maximizing the quality and lowering the cost for patients admitted with AMI or heart attack. So one of the metrics that they like to look at is medication on arrival and discharge. This specific example, you'll notice the parameter is based on aspirin um, on arrival. Um, they like to um, follow the best practice guidelines for um, the um, American Heart Association and just like the guidelines they, you know, they want to look at. And so you'll see that, you know, we do pretty good. They, but they really were trying to get closer to 100%, but this is a good metric. That there means they're following protocol and they're, they're um, you know, doing what they should be doing. So and we'll get into some other <laughs> So the cardiac rehab referral, um, this is for them to measure the, um, that they're also following best practices and the, for the registries we participate in. It's um, measured to make sure that the patient um, receives the proper continuation of care and that the discharge protocol is being followed. So we're not doing so good on this and they, they keep on um, trying to improve the education, is the protocol too complex to follow, like what's going on, but you know, we're making slow and steady. So it's not great, but we know that by looking at this dashboard, it's making a difference. And I mean, then a 12% improvement over a year. Yeah. It's not inconsequential, so. No, no, so. Um, but that's what they use it for. So they can actually see and they can actually um, drill further into these details. So is it a particular provider not following this protocol? Or like, do, we have, do they have to have a conversation with that particular provider? Is it more than one provider? And do they have to rethink of how they're, you know, they're trying to get them to follow maybe a difficult protocol that they have to simplify something because something's not working. So the um, Heart score is a fairly new process and it's um, and very new to the workflow and it's used to assess the risk uh, for a major cardiac event. So monitoring, monitoring this has focused on better user education to improve the documentation for each patient, um, but it's not a significant increase yet, but we can, again, see slight improvement. As someone said to us when we're <laughs> working through all this, why don't we show any good metrics? Well, what, ones where we're doing well. Well, we're doing better. And you know, the point of this isn't to say, yes, everything is great. You know, yeah. We're doing awesome at everything. This no. is just to show it's, it's, it takes time. You know? It takes time, and by being able to show this in Tableau, this is where we're going versus trying to show somebody an epic report and, and try to figure out. 
So they can look at this and going, okay, we're doing better, but we're not doing good enough. So what, what do we need to put into place to continually improve? So yeah, again, not all sunshine and lollipops. You know, we, it's, it, it's just a common thing, but I think that, that, that's what makes coming to work every day, you know. Fun? Fun, is, is that we know that they're making a difference. They're making a difference, you know, so. Yeah, Again. yeah, I mean, with the OB, with the ACS, you know, you actually see that it, there is an impact on patient care. You know, for, for mothers and, and babies, you, may, you have better outcomes for that. That's something tangible that you, know, you can actually feel good about and feel good about the work you do. So with our clinical care pathways, by the end of our fiscal year, um, come July, we'll have about 90% of our inpatient services covered on a, on a workbook to, for the clinical pathways. So it's 29 currently. The first year we did this, it was only six. Um, this year alone, we're gonna do seven, between 17 and 25. We've had more developers, Tableau developers along the way now, so it's a lot more people building these things, which introduces its own challenges as well. Uh, but you know, it's been good for our, our organization as a whole. So we, we want to leave you with a little technical tidbit too, and we really wanted to show you how we handle the protected health information. But we can't. Yeah. <laughs> but so. you, don't, you don't have access. <laughs> um, seriously though, at Lehigh Valley Hospital, we take protecting PHI very seriously. So originally when these pathways were rolled out, they were intended for the clinical population. Well, what Tableau, like I said, it went on a roll. It was fast and furious, and now the executives want to look at them. So we had, I don't know if it was like a VP or... A uh, lawyer. A lawyer. Of course. Who said, <laughs> you know, we understand that the executives want to look at it, but they do not have any clinical business looking at things. So you need to figure out how to handle PHI and how to show it when you need to and not show it when you can't. So we did a little, it's actually quite simple. It's what Tableau refers to as a, a row level security with filters at the group level. And pretty much what we do is we have active directory groups that we create for the population that is able to see PHI. And so within the dashboard, we create the calculated field and we check, are they a member of that particular PHI? We add that PHI filter to the worksheet and we set it to true. And in this case, they're active directory groups. They also work with local Tableau server server groups as well, and something important, like this is all done through our Tableau ser server security as well. Right. So then we'll create a little worksheet that contains a PHI message. We make it red, we make it bold, um, and we create just a calculated field called PHI text. Um, we do this just because we don't we do not want to get a lot of calls from the people who said they go to the patient details and nothing shows up. Right. So we oh, like to broken. show them a message and say, you know, it's been removed intentionally. And then they might call questioning why their security is the way that it is, but it doesn't mean that the dashboard's broken. So we, we really try to explain it in a nice way that they're not allowed to, to see it. And if people are requesting access for PHI, they, that is controlled by our providers who actually oversee the pathways themselves. So it's not on us as, uh, as analysts to determine who should or shouldn't. That goes through a clinical process. So then, you know, here are the steps. So we create that message worksheet. We um, use the, the PHI filter and we set it to false. And then what we do is down on the lower hand side, you'll see a, another no, that's not on that one. But we actually um, will test and select a user that we know does not have access to just make sure that it turns on and off and shows the details and or shows the message that it's been removed. And combined, that's just what you saw when we said we yep. could show you PHI. 
and that works pretty effective. It's been pretty effective for us. Again, the questions that we get are, well, why can't I see the PHI? Right. So, um, and all of that, there's a whole process. We have two quality, one quality doctor mm -hmm. who pretty much is the gatekeeper for whether we are allowed to give that person um, access to PHI or not. So it's, it's all, it's requested through a security, but he has the final say on whether they're clinically okay to see the data or not. So he's the gatekeeper. It's a simple solution, but it's been very effective uh, and, you know, simple to implement across all of our pathways, you know, seeing that we have 20 some, 20 plus now too. And because of having it through an AD group, the security goes directly to the security. We're like totally out of the security business. So, it's touchless. Yeah, it, touchless it just, part one. yeah, because then it goes through, um, you know, our, our security, security group. Security group. Gets added to the group and we added. don't have to touch it on Tableau server. You either yeah. get it or you don't, simple. So, yeah. So just a quick word about our distribution and Tableau server, how we actually get all of these workbooks into the hands of our users. So working with our web team, we created the Lehigh Valley Health Network Analytics Portal. At this time, it's generally geared toward management level, VP level, executive level. Uh, as things progress, we do have plans to open it up to more users across the network. However, that does mean more complex security. Uh, what the analytics portal is, is um, really just a web interface where we have our functional areas set up. You know, lower right corner there, that's our care pathways. Everything we've talked about, you can find down in that functional area. All of the Tableau workbooks on our, on our portal are published through the Tableau server. We just grab that link out of it and embed it onto the portal. Opens it up, really nice screen. You know, the security matches up with the AD groups. Um, otherwise, you know, the portal is self-service. We also have editors out within various departments across our network. If they have, you know, just PDFs or maybe they've developed their own workbooks, we'll help them vet it and actually get it onto our, our Tableau server and then publish to our analytics portal as well. Um, I've done a lot of work, you know, since, since I am a former software developer, I've kind of worked hand in hand with our web team to develop best practices for it and then worked with our editors and our end users to bridge that gap and show them this is how you work with our analytics portal. So just finishing up with some of the key benefits and our measurable impacts that we've had along the way. So length of stay, a big one. Um, applicable to just about every pathway on the list. The one exception would be the pregnancy episode. Well, there is no length of stay, but once they, the mother delivers the child, well, then you have a length of stay. You know, that's our inpatient piece of that pathway. Readmissions, nobody wants to come back to the hospital. We don't want you coming back. The patient doesn't want to come back. Insurance doesn't want you coming back. It's across the board. CMI, very real, very tangible, financial number attached to that. You know, OB, it's just the overall improved care. You know, better care during the pregnancy is going to equal a better outcome for both the mother and the child. And, you know, order set usage, you know, just the standard of care along the way. And the access to data. You know, most of our executives, our VPs, they don't work in Epic. You know, those are the nurses, those are the doctors, the PAs, those are the people in there every day with the patients working. The management team, they just want to see those high level aggregations. How are we doing? How, you know, are we doing more procedures? Are we getting people in and out the door as we should be? So what are, where, where are we going next? You know, we've done a lot of work in these two plus years. Where do we go from here? So more self-service analytics. So you know, at, to this point, pr most of this work has been done by our analytics team. But we've trained a lot more people throughout our network on Tableau now too. So they need access to data. A lot of times they have their own data. We need to get them self-sufficient to actually publish it out to, this, out to the server. You know, new data sources and certified data sources. What you've seen mostly has come off of our reporting database, 
but we do have a clinical data warehouse as well. It's a star schema warehouse. You know, we need to leverage that to create more data sources for more people to use. And, you know, evolving standards. Some of the stuff we, we showed you today, it's old stuff at this point. You know, it's, it's two years old in some cases. But there's always more stuff to do. There's always new projects to work on. When do we head back? You know? So the new developers, you know, we have not only outside of our team, but inside of our team too. So there are a few of us that have you know, more expertise than others. So I have my own projects to work on, but then I have to try and spin up new users along the way too. So how do we balance all of that? Anything that? No, you think no. you said it all? That covers it. <laughs> awesome, huge round of applause for Walter and Donna. Thank you. Excellent presentation. So we have time for a few questions. My buddy Dan Hogan is going to have a mic in that area. Please raise your hand and we'll come to you. Uh, first of all, everything you're doing, remember, you're saving lives and improving you know, the life of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so a little point change is a big difference. Yes. Um, I had one question about um, census when you look at length of stay. Okay. Did you find that you need to integrate that factor into it? You mean census for the geographical? Like demographics? Uh, no, or? census of the hospital. Oh. Like if the census at which is the number of patients, right. number so. of beds occupied in an emergency room, you might not have. We or, do, yeah, I, I understand where you you're know going. What I'm saying? Yeah. So we do have some workbooks, some metrics that focus on that. When it comes to the clinic or clinical care pathways, it's generally a more defined patient population. So for orthopedics, for instance, they have their own center where they schedule everything. So if, if the length of stay is longer, chances are it's some sort of complication. Um, we do have higher level metrics when it comes to the whole hospital and the census though too. Right, yeah. right. Question over here. Okay, question there. You had mentioned uh, you pull like real time information. What is the frequency of your data pulls out of Epic? Because we've run into a number of issues because you have stuff, people want stuff this day, but then you know, the claims information is always two, three weeks out. So how do you deal with the challenges of all the different timings of your data pulls? You want to? Well, I mean. Well, I mean in a lot of cases, well, it, it's really dependent on the data we're looking at, the workbook, and even how the, how the uh, stakeholders really want to look at it. Some of the stuff is updated daily. The OB stuff, for instance, that's daily. Every morning that loads. Um, we have a sepsis dashboard also that loads daily. Right. Um, other things, they're looking more, it depends. It depends on when sometimes the dashboard's a little bit more retrospective right. because they're actually looking at, um, like coded patients, where they coded with this specific, you know, ICD-10 code, and so it all depends. It, I mean, some of us are real time, and they're updated, yeah, you know, once a day. Near, versus, near real time, yeah. Yeah, near real time, because our, our um, I mean, our warehouse, our SQL database, our Clarity database, is only one day behind. Right. So, so we. So in, in the cases where the providers, the people on the floor need the data now, you're never going to get away from the Epic Workbench reports, and we still turn out plenty of them. Um, what we use the Tableau workbooks for are, you know, either identifying patients who are coming into an office who should have some focused care, or, the, you know, finding these longer trends to have quality improvement projects, rework order sets, whatever it might be. By the way, thank you so much. You have done a great job for this. Um, I have a question. Um, you use the data in Epic from Clarity database, correct? Correct. It has about like 10,000 tables. Yeah. How, can you share how you put Tableau on top of it? Um, well, for us, for, from a technical point of view, we have a service account on Tableau server. So the service account has access to the Clarity database. So that's what makes the connection. So individually as developers, we also have access to the Clarity database. So we would develop our SQL statements, our queries, either in, the stu in SQL Studio or in Tableau. Um, another favorite thing I would prefer to do are actually database views. 
So you define your SQL statement, put it into a view. You have that nice logical layer then that just sits on the database. You know, just drag and drop the view over, you're done. Publish the data source, set the refresh schedule, and you're effectively good to go. It's that service account. So you extract the data to service? Generally, yeah. Hi, we struggle with proliferation of AD groups for managing PHI. It sounded like you just have one in-out system. How do you deal with protected patient groups like those with HIV or behavioral health issues, for instance? Actually, that's something we haven't come to yet in Tableau. We don't have any of those groups out there yet. Thanks. Um, this piggybacks a little bit off the previous question about data sources. So you said you're working mostly with Clarity now. Can you speak a little bit about the difference in complexity with Clarity versus Caboodle and what your plans are for Caboodle in terms of connecting, figuring out what data you're going to use? I'd actually say Caboodle's probably simpler, um, probably better optimized for something like Tableau because it is that star schema. Um, you know, you can probably do some better data modeling with it because it's, it's made to be like that. Where we started from with the crystal reports, you know, a lot of those queries we were already writing to create brand new crystal reports within Epic. So it kind of made sense. We knew what we were doing. Uh, when it comes to where we're going with Caboodle, I want to just see, you know, we call them data marts, just these defined data models that we publish that probably will work a little bit better for more people, you know, have that certified data source and say, this is your population for knee, knee replacements, for hip fractures, for ACS, for instance. And then it's not only us, but then the trained Tableau developers in that specific department have access to that data too. Right, I think the caboodle will open it up to more users. We're hoping that it's just a better data source, because right now what we do is, yeah, we write specific SQL for those pathways against the Clarity database and pull that out and either, like, like Walter said, create a view. Sometimes we have, we have stored procedures running and they're updating table. It's an, a table that is then used to update the data source on Tableau. So it's, we, you know, we struggle with that because it's not easy to get the information out of out of Epic, so, but that's kind of how we started, but where we want to end up is right. to be able to use a data, more data, data, data warehouse, yeah. and they're recommending that we go with Caboodle because it's just an easier to get, easier transition to get that Epic data out into something. Yeah. We've struggled only just because, with, even within our team, there's been some infighting because we already have what Epic has as the Webby tools, and they've already created and taken time to create these universes, and yeah. we can't touch those universes. We can't get to those universes. There's not, we tried Universe Bridge. It did not do what we thought it would do, so we're still back writing our customized SQL right now, and we'd like to get away from that. Part of the other thing is, you know, some of those northern campuses that we've, you know, merged with, they're not yet on Epic either. So once they are, it's actually going to make life simpler because it's just going to be one source, you know, Clarity and Caboodle for all of our network. And it's just all one point for all of our clinical data. I was wondering if you have a group within your group that works more on exploratory uh, Tableau initiatives, our, our group. Uh, I, I'm a clinician as well as a data analyst, and mm -hmm. so I find when you we develop these, it leads to ten other questions, mm -hmm. and some you know showing length of stay doesn't really show what what you could change within there to affect it. Or it, so is there a way that you've developed where people where clinicians and people can work together to do more of an exploratory I think visualization? I think each of the pathways actually does that. We, we don't develop any of them in a vacuum. There's always you know, multiple people, multiple meetings, you know. They're like mini projects. Yeah. They're, so like when we say we're on these like pathways, like we, we're on a set schedule of developing these pathways and putting them out and we're still tied to those pathways, but you just kind of move on and they already, they're work, like when the first, when we're still working on the current pathways, they're already developing their specs and things and getting their meetings together so that by the time we're done developing one pathway, we're ready to go on to the next one. And 
they're getting, like I said, savvier because they are seeing what these dashboards are and they, in their head, they're already thinking like that. So we've gotten them out of the hyperspace, so they're, they're thinking along that they're seeing these other dashboards and they know what they can do, so it's already in their mindset to start. Yeah. And one of the pathways I was recently working on, you know, I spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with a pediatric doctor focusing on what works for him, what matters most to him, and even just validating the patient population. You know, it's like, well, I don't think this patient belongs in it, but I can see why you would pick him up. So, you know, it, yeah, nothing is developed in a vacuum. It's really this cohesive effort across the network at this point. Um, so nice presentation. Thank I'm you. curious if you could talk a little bit about the prioritization of, of your intake process, as well as how you ensure governance, stewardship, and certification of your data sources and dashboards? Well, ongoing. yeah, struggle. Um, it is an ongoing struggle. Uh, the pathways in particular were a strategic initiative, so that came down from the highest levels of the network. Um, does that act sometimes take away from some of the day-to-day -day backlog of the projects? Yes, absolutely. So yeah, there, there's a fine balance there. It's, it is tough to balance too, and you know, that's why we've started training more people outside of our analytics department. Um, when it comes to governance at this point, anything coming from Epic from Clarity is coming from the enterprise analytics team. So the outside groups, they don't have access to that. If they want something, we can define it for them and publish that data source, but they're not develop developing it themselves just yet. Is, that, is there something else? Okay. Um, my question is, with the data that's surfaced through your dashboards, what kind of formal or informal relationships have you established with the optimization process in the EHR? So what you want to show may not always be there, and also certain defaults inside the EHR may be pushing people towards certain decisions that you're seeing in the dashboard. So, so how does that loop get completed? So I guess maybe thinking about the order sets in particular. We have people on who work just with the Epic EMR, and we have a pathway champion, you know, a, a doctor who works primarily with the pathways. So you see an orthopedic knee replacement order set. You know, five out of the 10 orders are checked. So that's, you know, that's what you're focused on. And then we're using Tableau on the backside to say, is that happening? Are the actual providers using it? And if they're not, what order set or orders, are they just searching for an order to ambulate a patient? Um, Epic does a really good job of validating on the front end too. It does a lot of hard stops that prevent users from going down a path they shouldn't or requiring them to explicitly hit, yes, this is what I want to do. So, you know, from the back side, from the back end part of it, we don't necessarily worry about the validation part and even the optimization, because Epic does a really, really good job of handling all of that on the front end. Thank you, it was a very nice presentation. Uh, we are working on something similar in our organization. So I, out of curiosity, want to know, like I see there were multiple measures, like readmissions, OB, and mm -hmm. uh, so how do you handle the data? Like we have different views for these things, and it becomes a little bit harder when I want to, you know, uh, use one filter on five different data sources on Tableau, like blending data and all that. So how hard was it for you or, you know, if you have done anything like that? So my perspective is trying to put the onus largely on the database. That's why I love using the database views. Um, but I am a former software developer who spent, you know, 10, 12 years of my career working in Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, so if I can aggregate everything there that I need to, I find that works better when I'm publishing and working in Tableau itself. Um, the data blending can get messy sometimes. It, it works, but you know, I've run into instances where I prefer to just move, and, and you know, that's probably my preference and my expertise level. You know, I go skew more toward the database development side. Um, so I, I mean, that's, my, that's generally my suggestion even to my colleagues. You know, do your hard work on the database side, then load it into Tableau. Last question from out there. I, I think you actually maybe just touched on my question, but in terms of data source development, 
Um, we've run into issues where we've been trying to join visit data and billing data together. Okay. And trying to have Tableau do the heavy lifting mm -hmm. has caused quite a few issues. So my question to you is, do you guys build views for your data and then build the data source extracts on top of those for most of your content? Or how do you typically go about um, developing those? Primarily. Primarily, we do. It's primarily views. If the query is simple enough, fast enough, um, yeah, the views work great. If you're starting to get into flow sheet data, especially, that's where it gets cumbersome. So what we have in some of those cases, and we have a secondary database on top of Clarity that's effectively, it's a linked database to Clarity, so we fully qualify the names, go across the database, um, just have the views reside, reside on this reporting database. And even in some cases, we just define SSIS packages that you know, aggregate, collate the data, and put it in a nice format that we want. It's effectively creating a data mart specific right. to a pathway. Specific to the pathway. So like I said, this, the, like the stored procedure runs via an SSIS package, and it either will refresh a table or just kind of update it. Right. Like, so we'll, we can incrementally, incrementally update the data source, or we can blow away the whole table and just refresh, depending on how much data the, the pathway requires. And, and you know, oftentimes, the, da the database server is going to have more horsepower too, so push it off, off to there and prep your data and you're yeah, good to go. Yeah, bottom line, we try to do as much on the SQL side as possible, and so that by the time we get it into Tableau, it's just, it's Tableau ready, and maybe we have to add a few calculations, LODs, but we really try to stay out of the, you know, like making yeah. it really difficult on the Tableau side. So one of the issues we had, you know, was with actually MyChart data and patients logging into MyChart and what they're doing, you know, scheduling appointments, whatever it might be. Um, we ended up having about 40 million rows. We put that into a procedure, run it probably weekly, maybe monthly, I'm not sure, something like that. Um, just a really tall, really skinny table, just has, you know, maybe the five fields we need. And Tableau 10.1 just ate it up, no problem. And shocked me that it was like, you know, under five seconds probably for load time for, actually it's probably more like 60 million records now. But we put that onus on the database and Tableau just ate it up. Awesome, huge round of applause for Walter and Donna. I want to point out we have two sessions happening at four o'clock. We have a presentation from McKesson focused on Sprint Analytics, and we'll have Cerner presenting their Healthy Intent Solution and Customer Success Stories thereof. Also, in terms of integration with Epic, we actually have a partner ecosystem of SI vendors who are previously Epic, who can you know, help you with those challenges. They also have pre-built solutions on Tableau, which deliver you know, really quick time to value. So please talk to your respective account managers or send us an email and we can point you to them if needed. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your attendance today and all the questions. Great, guys.